Hey everyone, before I start this tutorial, I thought I'd just remind you guys that my next big horror game I'm working on, You Are Liam Shadow Memories, can be wishlisted on Steam, and plus, just recently I posted the first full game trailer for it. A lot of the models in this game are made by my friend Aaron Wise, who's definitely done a great job. So if you want to show your support, consider wishlisting ULEM Shadow Memories on Steam, and maybe even consider playing the demo on Itch.io. And without further ado, let's get right into the tutorial. So in this Unity tutorial, I'm going to be teaching you guys how to make a basic car that you can drive around. Here I have an example car I've made a few days ago before recording this tutorial so I could refreshen up on my car making skills. The first and last time I made a functioning car with actual car physics was for my game Bodhi and Friends, so it's been a while since I've made one. I've made another functioning car as well before in my Foreboding Tales game, but it didn't have proper car physics so it doesn't really count. By the end of this tutorial you should end up with a car like this which can drive around and even has rotating wheels as well. When it comes to the components we'll be making use of in this tutorial, such as the wheel colliders and the rigid body, there are quite a bit of values to adjust so you can get your car functioning just the way you like. For my car in this tutorial, I didn't have to change up much of the default values on the components, just a couple of values and that's it. If you want your car to keep its balance well or have more realistic physics, you can do that if you adjust your components values right. Okay, now I'm going to show you guys how to make the basic car. First off, get out a cube to use for your car's body. In case you don't know how to get out a cube, you just go game object, 3D object and cube and then boom, you've got yourself a cube. Size up your cube so that it's sort of in the shape of a car's body. And then you can rename your cube to something like car body, plus make sure the cube has a box collider attached to it as well, which by default it should. After that, you want to create a new empty parent object for your car body. You can do this by right clicking on your car body and selecting the option to create a new empty parent object. This will of course be the parent object of our car, so I'm going to call it car. Well actually I've already got my example car here from earlier, so I'm going to have to call it car too. Next, add a rigid body component to your car's parent object and I recommend playing around with its mass value as well. On my example car from earlier, I set the mass on its rigid body to 1500, so I'm going to do the same with this second car here since that's a value that'll probably be good for this car too. After prepping your car's parent object, right click on it and add an empty child object. This empty object is going to be one of our wheels, so add a wheel collider component to it. Once you add a wheel collider to your empty object, you should see the outlines of the wheels collider. Once you have your first wheel positioned, you can duplicate it three times and position your other wheels around your car. Make sure that the wheels on both the left and right side are evenly spaced from the car's body. Once you've positioned your wheel colliders, you can rename them so then you don't end up losing them in the hierarchy. So for my front left wheel collider for example, I'm going to call it front left wheel coal, coal being short for collider. Now that we've got the wheel colliders done, now let's add in the wheel meshes. Right click on your car's parent object and go game object, 3D object and cylinder, and then boom we have a cylinder. This cylinder will be the visual display of our wheel. Size the cylinder so then it's about the size of a wheel and position it in line with one of the wheel colliders. What I recommend you do to position it exactly right is you make the cylinder a child object of one of the wheel colliders. Make sure the XYZ position values of the cylinder are all set to zero and boom the wheel is in line with the wheel collider. When done, just move out your wheel from being a child object of the wheel collider and continue to do the same thing with the other three wheels. As you can see, I've got this simple goofy image I made which I'll be using as the material for the wheels. Why? 
Well, the reason as to why I'm applying a random texture to the wheels is so then we can see how they rotate, because obviously you can't see rotating wheels that well if they've got no texture to them. Now that we've got the visual representation of our wheels ready, we'll now be putting each cylinder under an empty parent object. Why? Well, the answer is so then the wheels rotate on the right axis. Because without a parent object, the wheels weren't rotating right from my experience. Just like how we renamed the wheel colliders, name the parent objects of your wheels meshes as well. So the front left wheels parent object for example will be called front left wheel, and so on and so forth. Also make sure that the parent objects of your wheel meshes are positioned in the right position. To check that, just unparent your wheel meshes, select your empty parent, and if you notice the position isn't right, just make the parent object the child object of its wheel mesh, and zero out the XYZ values so it's positioned in the center of the mesh. Once done, you can make the wheel mesh a child object of the parent object again, and you're all good to go. It's important to check this for the rotation of the wheels. Once your wheels are all set up, select them all, right click, and create an empty parent object which will hold all of our wheels. This is mainly to make the hierarchy neater. Rename this parent object to something like wheels so you know it's a parent object for your wheels. Next up I'll be setting up the wheel collider values. Since I've already got them set up on my example car, I'm just going to copy the component values and paste them over to the wheels on the car I'm making now. You guys can copy the values I have on my wheel colliders if you find they work for you, otherwise you can adjust your wheel collider values however you see fit. Now that we're done with making the structure of the car and applying some needed components, I'm now going to show you guys the scripts I've made to get this car functioning. What I'll do is I'll go through line by line and explain how each bit of the code works. The first script I'm going to be showing you guys is the main car script. In order to create a script if you don't know how to, just right click on your project folder, go create, and then C sharp script. Then just name your script something like car, and you'll be good to go. Once creating your script, double click to open it. First off, I'm going to be going over the variables. The first variable we have is a public rigid body simply called rigid. This is for our car's rigid body component. Also, if you're wondering what public means, that basically just allows us to assign the variable publicly in the Unity editor. Next we have four public wheel collider variables simply called wheel, followed by a number. These are for our wheel collider components attached to our car's wheels. Thirdly, we have two public float variables called drive speed and steer speed. These are for the values we want our general speed and steering speed of the car to be. In case you don't know what a float is, it's basically a number with a decimal point. Integers, for example, are whole numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Meanwhile, examples of floats would be 1.25, 2.43, 5.1, 6.8, 2.3, stuff like that. And also, floats can be whole numbers if you want them to be as well. They don't need to be a decimal point, but you have the ability to do that. Lastly, we have two float variables called horizontal input and vertical input, which will be used to get the values from the player's input. If the player presses the A and D keys, that will affect the horizontal input, and if the player presses the W and S keys, that'll affect the vertical input. So now that we're done talking about the variables, let's talk about the update void and what's going on in here. So the update void, for those who don't know, is a function that makes the code occur every frame. In this update void, horizontal input equals to input.getAccessHorizontal, and then on the next line, vertical input equals to input.getAccessVertical. What this means is that our horizontal input float will be getting the player's horizontal input, so whether they're pressing the A or D keys for example, and our vertical input will be getting the player's vertical input, so whether they're pressing the W or S keys. Next up is the fixed update void, and the reason as to why I'm using this function for this specific section of code is because this code is physics related and has to do with the car movement, and usually fixed update voids are used for a lot of physics related stuff, so yeah. 
In this first line of this void, we create a float called motor, which will equal to the vertical input multiplied by the drive speed. This input.getAccess vertical part of the code should just be our vertical input float, but using input.getAccess vertical is totally fine too, since it's essentially just the same thing as using the vertical input float. So basically what this line of code is doing is it's getting our player's vertical input and multiplying the drive speed by it so then the car can move at that speed. If the player isn't pressing any of the vertical input keys for example, vertical input will equal to zero. Therefore when being multiplied by the drive speed that'll equal to zero too so the car won't move. For the next four lines of code we have, all four of the wheel collider's motor torques will equal to what motor equals to. So then the wheels are moving the car. Then for the last two lines of code, we have the first two wheel colliders, aka the two front wheels, having their steer angle equal to the steer speed multiplied by the horizontal input. So then the wheels turn at the wanted speed based on the player's horizontal input. So that there is pretty much the main car script. When you've got your car script done, make sure you save it and exit back into the Unity editor. When back in the Unity editor, apply your car script to the parent object of your car and fill in the variables. Make sure that wheel 1 and 2 are your two front wheels on your car by the way, that's important. And also I'll be setting my drive speed to about 600 since that works on my other car. And then I'm going to be setting the steer speed to 40. Again, you guys can set these values to whatever works for you. Now that we've got the main functionality for our car done, let's test it out and see how everything works so far. So as you can see, my car is moving around quite fine, very similarly to my other car since I have the same values and stuff applied to it. The only thing we're missing now are the rotating wheels. So next up I'll show you guys how the wheel rotation script works. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the wheel script and go through line by line how it all functions. First up we have a public wheel collider variable simply called wheel collider. This is for the wheel collider that your wheel mesh visually represents. So when you attach this script to your front left wheel mesh for example, you'll want to fill in this variable with the front left wheel collider. Secondly we have a public transform variable simply called wheel mesh. This is for the parent object of the wheel mesh you assign your wheel script to. The reason as to why we are using a transform variable is because this will be how our wheel rotates. Lastly, we have a public bool variable called wheel turn, which will determine if the wheel the script is attached to will turn or not. For those who don't know, bulls or booleans as they are called in long form are variables that equal to either true or false. So if wheel turn equals to true, for example, the wheel the script is attached to will turn depending on the player's steering. You only want to have wheel turn enabled on both the front wheels, and you'll want to make sure that wheel turn is disabled on the back wheels of your car. Now that we're done with the variables, let's talk about the code inside of the update void. So if wheel turn equals to true, the local Euler angles of the wheel mesh will be updated. This will be based on the XYZ values, so the X and Z values of the wheel mesh will remain the same. However, when looking at the Y value, you can see that it equals to the steer angle of the wheel collider minus the Z axis of the wheel mesh's local Euler angles. And sorry if I'm pronouncing Euler wrong as well, I'm not really too sure how that is like properly pronounced. This line of code is what's used to make our front wheels turn on their y-axis, depending on the steer angle of the wheel colliders. For the last line of code, we have wheel mesh.rotate, and our wheel mesh is rotating on its x-axis based on the RPM of the wheel collider, divided by 60, multiplied by 360, and then multiplied by time.delta time. If you're wondering what the zeros are for, they're to show that the wheel isn't rotating on its y or z axis, they're rotating on their x axis. For those who don't know what RPM is by the way, that just means rotations per minute, and the reason as to why we divide that by 60 is because there's 60 seconds in a minute, so dividing the RPM of the wheel collider by 60 will give us the rotations per second. And then we multiply that by 360 to convert it into degrees, since 360 degrees is a complete rotation. And time.delta time makes sure that, that no matter what 
frame rate you have, the wheel's rotation speed will stay the same either way. And boom, that there is the wheel rotation script. Now what you'll want to do when you have your script ready is apply the wheel script to all four of your wheel meshes and fill in the needed variables. Once you fill in the variables of your wheels, you should be good to go for another test run, but first, don't forget to make sure that your two front wheels have wheel turn enabled. One other thing I should say as well is make sure your car's parent object is pointing in the right direction. To check that, make sure this tool here is set to local instead of global, click the parent object of your car, and make sure the blue arrow is pointing forward. If it isn't, then just move all the children objects from underneath your car's parent object, and then turn your parent object around so then the arrow is facing in the right direction. And then you can move the child objects back underneath the car parent object and you're good to go. Now that our car is complete, let's give it a test ride. So as you can see, the car works just as intended, now with rotating wheels. If you guys enjoyed this tutorial or learned something from it, be sure to like, comment and subscribe for more and consider checking out my games on itch.io, a majority of them are free. And I also have a new Christmas game coming out on December 15th, hopefully, called Xmas Slaughter. I hope you guys do like the game when it comes out since I've put so much time into it and it will be free as well. Again guys, if you enjoyed, be sure to like, comment and subscribe for more and I'll see you all next time, Bye bye